Okay, so for this video, we'll be discussing um, paper one, pure maths one, for October, November 2023, paper one, three. Okay, so let's start with question number one. There's a curve such that uh, the gradient at a point is given to this one. So they already give us the equation of gradient, dy dx equals to this whole expression here. It is given that the curve passes through the point four one, and they want us to find the equation of the curve. Equation of the curve means the y. So to get the dy d, dy dx uh, to become the y, basically we need to apply integration. Okay. So to get the y, we will start the integration. So we want to integrate dy dx, which is x minus three x power negative half then dx okay so we start to integrate it slowly integrate the x you take the power plus one become two divided by the new power okay minus the three three you just copy it is a constant you just copy now integrate x power negative half negative half plus one become positive half divided by the new power then there's a constant term at the back okay so to make my equation looks not so complicated Usually, I prefer to simplify it first. Huh? So, 3 divided by half, you will get 6. So, you're having 6x power half, then plus c. So, now I want to get the value for c. To get the value of c, I need the information here, where x equals to 4 and also y equals to 1. I will substitute it into my solution here to get the c. Okay, so um, from here, I know that maybe at the point 4, 1, y is a 1, right? Substitute into the y. Then half, x squared, x squared means 4 squared, for this case, then negative 6, square root 4, plus c. So if you try to simplify all these terms here, okay, so by right, you have the value of c, which is equal to 5. And of course, don't forget to rewrite your final answer again in a complete form of the equation of y. Alright, so you're having y equals to half x squared minus 6 square root x plus 5. Okay, so basically, this is how we get the y, the equation of the curve from dy dx. So the process involved is integration. Okay, so now we are at question number 2. There's a circle with this equation. Intersect the y axis at point A and also B. They want us to find the y coordinate of A and B expressing the answer in the third form. Okay, so when you are seeing something like this, uh, intersect the y-axis, basically it means that your x value is 0. When your x value is 0, then only you have the point that intersect with the y-axis in the curve, right? Okay, so I will let x equals to 0 by letting x equals to 0 in the circle equation. So from here, I will be able to get the y-coordinate. So let's start. So I'm having 0 minus 3 squared plus y minus 5 squared equals to 40. Okay, so I'm having 9. 9 plus y minus 5 square equals to 40. And then I'm having y minus 5 square equals to 31, right? Okay, so if I take square root, then I need to consider both plus and minus sign for square root 31. And after that, my y equals to 5 plus minus square root 31. Okay, so I'm having two answers here. Left. One is 5 plus square root 31, another one is 5 minus square root 31. So it is actually the, both of them are actually the x, uh, the y intersect, okay, for the point A and B. Alright, so this is what we have. Okay, then we can proceed to part number B. So for part number B, they want us to find the equation of the circle uh, when the A, B has a, uh, is the diameter. Okay, so now you try to imagine uh, your A and also your B is the diameter of a circle. Okay, so let's say this is a diameter of a circle. So your circle will look something like this. Okay, and then just now, because we already know that uh, our coordinate for the A and B, right? So let's say I let A uh, equals to 0 and then the coordinate is 5 plus square root 3, let's say, uh, square root 31. Then maybe the B is actually the lowest point, lower point, where B is 0 also. And then it is 5 minus square root 31. 
Okay, so I know that the x coordinate for A and B is zero because just now they already mentioned, right? A and B are actually the point that intersect the the first circle intersect the y axis. Therefore, the x coordinate will be the zero. So this is now my uh, A and B with the x and y coordinate. And also now we know that A and B is the diameter of another circle. All right. So when A and B is the diameter of another circle, where is the center? So the center will be the midpoint of A and B. Okay. So to get the center, what we need to do is like, um, you need to find out the midpoint of A and B. So which is 0 plus 0 divided by 2. And also 5 plus square root 31 plus 5 minus square root 31 divided by 2. So from here, you can see that actually our circle should be 0 and also 5. So this is my center of the circle. Okay, so after the center of the circle, I need uh, the radius, right? So to get the radius, I know the diameter here. So what is the diameter for this A and B? So the length of the diameter is actually 5 plus square root 3, 31 minus 5 minus square root 31. Okay, so from here, you should have square root 31 or 2 square root 31. And this is diameter. So to get the radius, radius means that di uh, diameter divided by 2, right? So you have 31 square root as a radius. So now you have the important, the two important information that we need uh, to form the circle equation, which is the center and also the radius. Therefore, the equation of the circle for this particular question is equation of circle. Okay, so the general, the standard equation is x minus the x coordinate of the center. Square plus y minus the y coordinate square equals to radius square root 31 squared. So if you try to further simplify it, you should have x squared plus y minus 5 squared equals to 31. Alright, so this is how we form the equation of the circle where the A and B are the diameter, forms the diameter of the circle. Okay, so question number three. They want us to show the equation that um, this equation can be expressed into the form of uh, a quadratic equation in the terms of cos theta. Okay, so this one is our final answer, should, how our final answer should look like, and then this is our starting equation. So in our starting equation, we have sine and tangent. So we have to slowly to rephrase everything become cos. <clears throat> so let's start here. So I'm having 5 cos theta, then minus sine theta, tangent theta plus 1. Okay, then uh, first of all, I will want to change the tangent become sine over cos first. Okay, because um, in our equation, I want to actually avoid all the tangent and sine, but no, no, no matter how, I just try to rephrase it, become something related to cos. Okay, that equals to 0. So from here to here, I'm using the identity where tangent theta can be written as sine theta over cos theta. Okay, and after that, what can we do? We want to make the denominator here disappear, right? So I multiply the whole equation by cos theta. So I'm having 5 cos square theta minus sine square theta, then plus cos square, oh sorry, cos theta equals to 0. And again, compare our solution here, okay, our step here with the final answer, you can see that, oh, I'm still having a sine square here, but my final answer, everything is about cos. So very obvious, you need to do something with the sine square, right? So what is the identity that we can apply uh, to replace the sine square by something related to cos square? So sine square can be written as 1 minus cos square. Okay, then plus cos theta equals to 0. So again, from here to here, basically I'm using the idea where sine square plus cos square equals to 1. Case by can be written as 1 minus cos square theta. Okay, so this is something that I'm using here lah, for this step. Then slowly simplify it. 
I think we should be able to get the pattern that they want us to show. Okay, so I can further simplify, right? 5 cos square plus cos square, you are, you're getting 6 cos square theta, then plus cos theta minus 1 equals to 0. So double check and see whether is it the pattern that they want to show. I think yes, right? So all our terms here are in terms of cos. And I hope that you can see that this is actually a quadratic form equation in terms of cos. Okay, so this is how we solve part number A for question number 3. Okay, so we can proceed to part number B. For part number B, they want us to show, uh, want to solve this equation. Okay, so again, the equation is what we have in part A also, right? And we have rephrased it, become this quadratic form equation in terms of cos. So we can actually try to solve it from where they want us to prove, uh, what they want us to prove from here. It is actually a hint for us. Okay, to solve this equation, it will be easier if we solve it by using the result that we get in part number A. Right, so I will straight away solve this equation. So this equation basically is a quadratic form equation in terms of cos. So if let's say you can't really see clearly, you actually can see it like this. If you let y equals to cos theta, right? So when you rephrase the equation, you're having 6y squared plus y minus 1 equals to 0. So I hope that you can see the pattern here. Okay, but of course, if you can see clearly, you no need to substitute cos theta as the y. Alright, so this is just a, a, for those who are not able to see clearly that this is a quadratic form equation. Okay, so to solve this equation, I will solve it from quadratic form equation here, where I will want to factorize my equation. So if I want to factorize my equation, I will be having um, 6 cos squared. I can write become 3 cos theta and also 2 cos theta. Then I'm having 1 and 1 here. So the standard term here, they want a positive 1. So I will have plus 1 here and minus 1 here. Okay, then you can start solving the equation here where cos theta equals to 1 over 3 and also cos theta equals to negative half. Okay, so continue to solve this. Okay, so first of all, I will get the basic angle for the first equation here which is cos inverse 1 over 3 so cos inverse 1 over 3 will give me the basic angle 1.23 okay so it will give me the basic angle 1.23 and then to get the theta i need to go through all the quadrant that fulfill the condition where the cos is positive Okay, so we are having something like this. Uh, or sine tangent cos. Okay, so all the basic angle that we find, right? Basically, I refer it as theta. It is in the acute, acute angle in the first quadrant. So uh, I'm looking for cos with a positive value. 1 over 3 is positive, right? So I'm looking for the quadrant with cos positive value. So for the first quadrant, cos is positive, right? Because everything is positive. Huh? Okay, so my first answer will be 1.23. Okay, after that, for the second quadrant, only sine is positive. So I don't want the answer from this part. Third quadrant, tangent positive. I also don't want the answer from this part. And the fourth quadrant, cos is positive. So I want the answer from this part. So to get the answer from this quadrant, basically you need to take 2 pi minus the basic angle that you get. The theta here means the basic angle, right? So you have to take 2 pi minus the basic angle that we have just now is 1.23. So if you minus it at 2 pi minus 1.23, by right you should have 5.05. Okay, so after you go through one quadrant, that means that it is already fulfilled the condition where the theta must be from 0 until 2 pi. 0 until 2 pi means one round, four quadrants. So you have walked through the four quadrants, so you can stop here for this equation. So now we continue with this particular equation here. Okay, so to get the basic angle for cos theta equals to half uh, without the negative sign, okay, it should be 60 degree. So 60 degree means pi over 3. This is the basic angle for cos theta equals to positive half. Okay, so basic angle is pi over 3. And again, I want to go through the quadrant to get 
the answer where the quadrant for cost is a negative value. So again, basic angle is theta, which is pi over 3. So for first quadrant, everything is positive, but I'm looking for cost negative. Therefore, I do want the answer from this quadrant. Okay, then how about for second quadrant? Second quadrant side positive, that means cost is negative. Huh? So we are looking for cost negative, right? So I want the answer from this particular quadrant. To get an answer from this particular quadrant, you need to take pi minus the basic angle, which means that you are taking pi minus pi over 3. Pi over 3 is our basic angle. Therefore, you have 2 pi over 3 for this case. Okay, then after that, for the third quadrant, tangent positive, which means that cost is negative as well. So I also want the answer from this quadrant. So to get the answer from this quadrant, you have to take pi plus the basic angle. Again, okay? basic angle is pi over 3. So when you add them together, you should have 4 pi over 3. Then fourth quadrant is cost positive, positive where I don't want the answer from this part. So you, have, you can see that our data will have four answers here. One, two, three, four. So usually I will try to rewrite and rephrase all my answer again in the maybe in the final line of the question. So I'm having 1.23. This is the first quadrant one. Second quadrant is this. Third quadrant. And also fourth quadrant. So I'm having four answers here for this question. Okay, All right. So this is basically how we solve for the question number three. Okay, so we are now, now at question number four. They want us to expand the flowing uh, bracket uh, in the extending power of x. So you have to include the x squared. Okay, so basically this is binomial uh, expansion. Uh. So for binomial expansion, if you can't remember the formula, you can get it from the formula booklet. Okay, under the pure mathematics part, and then you scroll down to binomial series. Okay, so this is the general formula that we have uh, for binomial expansion. Then uh, if you have a look here, basically all the terms are having this pattern where you're having nc something, then b, if let's say the something here is power 1, so b will follow the power 1 then the power in front will be n minus 1. Okay, so every single term basically uh, form, for, follow this pattern, right? So let's continue back further. So they want us to expand the bracket here, right? There are two brackets here. So include the term in x squared. Okay, so according to the formula that we have, uh, basically it's like this. Uh, so if let's say I want to expand 1 plus 2x power 5. So I'm having the first term, which is nc0, so 5c0. A is power 5, and then B, B is the 2x at the back, power 0. Alright, then the second term will be next term, M, MC1, NC1, so 5C1, then 1 power 4, because 5 minus 1, you get a 4, and then the B, B is 2x, power, follow the power 1. Then next term, 5C2, okay, 1 power 3, then 2x power 2. Okay, so... Of course, if you want to continue expanding, no problem. But since the question just want us to include under the x squared, so I think I will stop here. Like I won't expand further because if you expand further, you will see that the x power, the power of the x will be increasing until x power 3, x power 4, x power 5, and so on. Okay. All right. So uh, after you write out the formula here, okay, kindly just press calculator and make sure that you don't do any careless mistake. So by right, you should have 1 as a first term, then 10x as a second term and also 40x squared as the third term. So this is what we have for the ascending power of x up to and including x power 2. Okay, so this is what we have for the first bracket here. And after that, for the second bracket, we apply the same thing. Okay, so first term is nc0, so 6c0, 1 power 6. Then the b is negative ax, don't forget about the negative here. So you're having power 0. Okay, so the second term will be 6c1, 1 power 5. How I get a 5? You take 6 minus 1. Okay, then negative ax power 1. Then also 6c2, 1 power 4, negative ax squared. So same thing applies here. When I want to expand on the x power 2, right, this term will give me x power 2. So if I continue further, I will have ax power 3, where it already included the term for x power 3. So this is something that I don't want, right? So I will just stop here for x squared. Okay, then again, try to expand everything and make sure that don't do any careless mistake. First term is still a 1. Second term, I'm having um, 6, negative 6ax. And then the third term, I'm, I'm having 15a squared x squared. 
So this is how we expand the first three terms for the second bracket here. Okay, all right. So if continue further for part number B. So for this expansion, the coefficient of x squared is negative 5. So they are talking about the coefficient of x squared and it is negative 5. They want us to find the possible value of a. So if you have a look for this expansion, right, there are two brackets here. Basically, the first bracket here from part A1. And the second bracket is actually from part A2, right? Okay, so to get the coefficient of x squared, I need to multiply the expansion for these two brackets together and look for the coefficient for x squared. Which means that I will uh, substitute the result that I get in first part, okay, for this bracket here. So I will be having this 1 plus 10x plus 40x squared. Okay, so this is for the first bracket. How about for the second bracket? So for the second bracket, the answer that I get is 1 minus 6ax plus 15a squared x squared. Okay, then we are interested okay, to multiply these two expansions together and focus on the coefficient of x squared. So of course, some students, they might want to expand every single term also can, just at the time is longer so if let's say you know how to get only the x square term then you can just directly focus on the x square term so like for me i know that one okay i can multiply with this one to get the x square so i'm having 15 a square x square okay then after that 10x i know that if i multiply with this second term here i will get something with x square as well so if I multiply them together, then I will be having 60, negative 60, then a x squared. Okay, then for the last term, okay, so maybe for the next term is this one, 40 x squared. I know that multiply with 1, I will get something with x squared. So plus 40 x squared. Okay, so you can see that all these are x squared terms. Okay, the terms in x squared. So I will factorize out the x squared by grouping all the constant, uh, co all the coefficient together. So I'm having this, and then multiply with x squared. And since in the question they tell us that oh the coefficient is equal to this value negative five, so to find the value of a, I have to solve this equation. I compare the coefficient in my solution here with the value of negative five. So I will take fifteen a squared minus sixty a plus forty equals to negative 5 and then simplify it. you will see that um, basically you get a quadratic equation right okay if you further simplify until the last step is this one uh, I will be having a square minus 4a then plus 3 equals to 0 okay so this is what we have and then uh, you can further simplify it and solve the equation, right? Since this is a quadratic equation, so I can factorize them. By right, I will have x minus um, 3 and also x minus 1. Sorry, it's a minus 3 and also x minus 1. Okay, and after that, continue solve it, you'll get two values of a, which is a equals to 3 and also a equals to 1. Right. Yeah, so this is how we solve the question number four. Okay, so now at question number five, we are given first, second, and third term of a geometric progression, right? Uh, given like this, uh, these, these three terms here. So by right, you should know that the first term is this one, A, and then the second term is 5P, and also the third term is 8P plus 2. Okay, they want us to find the possible value of the constant P. Okay, um, to find the constant P, right? Uh, first of all, we need to know that this is a geometric progression. So what is the uh, general details that we need to know about the geometric progression? So uh, basically, you know, for a geometric progression, right, the common ratio, which is R, you can get the R common ratio by dividing the later term with the previous term. So as an example, R, I can get it by using D2 over A. So that means the second term divided by the first term. Okay, then, or you can also get it by using Oh, sorry, I think I make a careless mistake here, right? This one is a three, third term. Or you can actually try to use the third term divided by the second term. You can also get a common ratio R. 
So by using this information, second term divided by first term, get the common ratio R. And also third term divided by the second term, also get the common ratio R. So we are using this information to solve the question. So D2 divided by A equals to D3 divided by 2. So what do I have for D2? So D2 is actually 5P divided by A. My first term is 2P plus 6 equals to third term 8P plus 2 divided by 5P. Okay, so from here, if you rephrase it slowly, right, you will be having 25P squared and then 8P plus 2 and also 2P plus 6. Okay, expand it. Okay, so try to expand it by right, you will have 16p squared, then plus 48p, then plus 4p plus 12. Expand it slowly, like, yeah. Okay, then after that, you simplify your equation. You should have a quadratic equation as well. So 9p squared minus 52p minus 12 equals to 0. So again, very obvious, this is a quadratic equation. So you can try to factorize and solve it to get the value of p. Okay, so to get a 52, I put 9p, then 6 and 2. Okay, so I'm having this. Alright, so very easily, you can see that uh, I successfully get the value of p like, after solving the quadratic equation. So I'm having two values for the p, where one p is negative 2 over 9, and also another p is 6. Okay, so that's the value of p. Okay, so let's continue to part number b. For part number b, they are saying that one of the values p found in a is a negative fraction. Okay, and then they want us to use this value of p to find the sum to infinity of this progression. So again, we are having two values of p in the first part, right? So they ask us to use the negative p, p equals to negative 2 over 9, okay, to find the sum to infinity. Okay, so again, we'll continue. Before we can find out the sum to infinity, right? I want to find out the common ratio first and also the first term. Okay, so if you are, you are saying, you are, maybe if you're asking why do I need to find out the first term and also the common ratio first, huh? it is because of the sum to infinity formula basically is A divided by 1 minus R. So I need to know what is the value for common ratio. I also need to know what is the value for the first term. Okay, so I found the A first. So what's the formula for first term? So just now you already have it in the question. A is 2P plus 6. So you put in 2 and then P. P is negative 2 over 9 and plus 6. Okay, so by right you should have 50 over 9. After that, you want to get the common ratio R. So to got, get the common ratio R, you can take either D2 divided by A first term or the third term divided by the second term. Up to you. You can choose any fraction that you like. Okay, both will give you the same value of R. So for me, I'm taking the first one. Okay, 5P divided by 2P plus 6. So I will have 5P divided by 2P plus 6. So we try to do a little bit of uh, calculation. Maybe you can use calculator if you want. Then it will be, you will be having negative 1 over 5. Okay, so after I get a common ratio, I get the first term for this progression, then I can proceed with the sum to infinity. Okay, so the sum to infinity formula is A divided by 1 minus R. Okay, just substitute in the value. Alright, so 50 over 9 divided by 1 minus negative 1 over 5. Okay, so again, so simplify this whole uh, fraction here. By right, you will have 125 divided by 27. So I'll keep it in the fraction form. Okay, so this is how we solve question number 5. Okay, so question number 6, there's a line with this equation. And then, um, this, is, this is a linear equation. And then there's a curve with this equation. And... Line is the tangent to the curve at point P. So highlight the keyword tangent. Okay, so when you're having a curve, right? Okay, and also a linear function, a straight line. So when they say that the straight line is a tangent to the curve, 
that means that you can see only one intersection point between the line and the curve and we are going to apply the concept where we let the curve equations equals to the line equation right there's only one intersection point can be found where we will use the discriminant equals to zero all right then to use this discriminant equals to zero then i think we'll be able to find the c in the equation here right so let's start we are having the first equation y equals to 6x minus c and also the second equation y equals to cx squared plus 2x minus 3 okay so of course i will let equation number one equals to equation number two and from here this is what i get Okay, so rephrase everything, become a quadratic form equation. So I am having cx squared, then uh, minus 6x, oh sorry, minus 4x, 2 minus 6 is a negative 4, right? Then uh, I'm having c minus 3 equals to 0. So this is a quadratic form equation. And how we get this, it is because of we let the line equation equals the curve equation. Uh, assume that we want to find out the, code, uh, the intersection point, uh, and there are only one intersection point between the line and the curve. Therefore, we are going to use the result where the discriminant should be equal to 0. So b squared minus 4ac equals to 0. This is what I'm going to use here. So b squared is negative 4 squared minus 4. The a will be the c in this case, and then the c will be the constant term c minus 3 equals to 0. Okay, so try to expand them. Okay, so again, we are getting another quadratic equation here, where if I simplify it, finally I will get this one, minus 3c divided by negative 4, right? So minus 4 equals to 0. Alright, so from here, to get the value of c, of course, we need to solve this quadratic equation. So I can factorize them, where I'll get c, uh, 4 and 1, so minus 4 plus 1 equals to 0. So from here, you get c equals to 4 and also c equals to negative 1. Okay, so we successfully fully find out the value for c here. Okay, so if you have a look for the question again, they are saying that find the possible values of c. So we at least settled, settled this part. Okay, so find out the value of c already. And now they want to find the corresponding coordinates of p. So P is actually the intersection point, okay, between the line and the curve. And it is also actually the, uh, the, the how to say, the line uh, at point P, right, basically is a tangent to the curve. Uh, so it is actually the intersection point between the curve and also the line, basically. All right, so I want to know what is the coordinate for the P here. So how to find out the coordinate of P here, you can use the result that you found just now, where... I'm having two values of p. The first one is when c equals to 4, right? The line is a tangent to the curve. So when c equals to 4, substitute c equals to 4 into your quadratic equation with the x1 so they can find the x coordinate of the p. So substitute 4 here, I will be having 4x squared, then minus 4x. 4 minus 3 become a 1, then equals to 0. So by right, right? Um, when you factorize this quadratic equation, uh, by right, you should have only one value of x. Uh. So from here, you can see that this is true because I'm having one value of x here where x equals to half. Okay, so this is x equals to half. And after that, I want to use x equals to half to find the value of y. So what's the value of y here? You can substitute into either equation number 2 or equation number 1. Uh. Then for me personally, I feel that linear equation is easier for us to find out the coordinate of y. So I substitute x equals to half here and also c equals to 4 here. So 6 divided by 2, you get a 3, minus 4, you get a negative 1. So the y coordinate will be negative 1. And therefore, when c equals to 4, the coordinate of the p is half and negative 1. Okay, so besides this value of c, we have another value of c, which is c equals to negative 4, right? So we apply the same thing to what we did just now. 
So when the C is equal to negative 1, substitute it into the quadratic equation with the x. Huh? So I'm having um, negative x squared minus 4x minus 4 equals to 0. Then I try to simplify them, become x squared plus 4x plus 4 equals to 0. So again, when you try to factorize them, you will see the two same value here. It should be x plus 2 and also x plus 2 equals to 0. So from here, you actually get the value x equals to negative 2. And again, use it to find the value of y. So if you didn't do any careless mistake, right? So substitute negative 2 into this equation here. So negative 12. Negative 12 minus negative 1. So you have negative 11. That means, huh? Now, the other value for c is when c equals to negative 1, then the p coordinate will be negative 2 and also negative 11. Alright, so this also actually means that at these two points, right, at these two points of p, the line basically will pass through the curve once, which is the tangent to the curve. Alright, yeah, so this is uh, the two possible coordinate for the p. Lah. Okay. Okay, so let's discuss question number seven. Right, uh, so we are given the function and also the given domain, yeah? Then they want us to state the range of f, right? So um, every time when we um, want to find out the range of f, right? Um, generally, there are a lot of different methods that we can actually get the range. Okay, then for me personally, um, I'm using mainly uh, transformation of graph, uh, which is also covered in the chapter two in AS syllabus, right? AS math syllabus. So although my method is longer, but generally when I'm using the transformation to help me to sketch a graph, it helps me to um, look clearer. Okay, what is the graph that I have and also which part of the graph that I want to consider for the range. Okay, so first of all, for this function, right, the basic function basically starts from 1 over x. So how is the graph of 1 over x looks like? So it basically looks something like this. Okay, so this is the graph of 1 over x. And then for the next step, we are going to change it become 1 over x minus 2. So when you want to change it become 1 over x minus 2, what will happen to the graph? So the x minus 2, right, the minus 2 is actually inside the basic function, belongs to the x. Therefore, you are going to move your whole graph two units to the right hand side. So if I move the whole graph two units to the right hand side, that means the asymptote, originally asymptote is y equals to uh, x equals to zero. So now it will become x equals to two. So I'm, I'm moving the whole graph two units to the right. So my graph will look something like this. So the shape of the graph basically still the same, just that I try to translate it. Okay, translate, translate the whole graph two units to the right hand side. And then to make the calculation easier, Usually, I would encourage students to find out the x-intercept or y-intercept that we have. So for this one, it is the y-intercept when x equals to 0, right? So for this graph, it is 1 over x minus 2. Therefore, this particular point here will be actually negative half. Okay, then after that, for the next step, I want to make it become 3 over x minus 2. Okay, so how will the graph 3 over x minus 2 looks like? Okay, so 3 over x minus 2, huh? basically it is a stretch in y direction. You multiply a 3 to the function, right? So when you have a stretch in the y direction, it will affect your y value. It will not affect your x value. That the asymptote is still equal to... So your graph is still having the same shape. Just that the value of y will be affected. So that means oh, the value of y will be affected, which is this one. The y-intercept here will be affected. Original y is negative half. Okay. And now I need to multiply a 3 to the function. Therefore, the value of y here, negative half, you have to multiply it with 3. And this value will become negative 3 over 2. Okay. So this is actually a stretch in y direction. And... After that, I want to continue further for the for the next step, which is you are adding one, okay, outside the whole fraction here. Okay, so when you are adding one outside the whole fraction here, plus one means that you are going to move your whole graph one unit going up. 
Okay, so one unit going up, which means that the asymptote still remain the same for the x equals to 2. Original asymptote is y equals to 0. You want to move up one unit. Therefore, it will become the asymptote y equals to 1. The shape of the graph basically still the same. But when you are trying to move your whole graph, one unit going up, right, the value of y here will be affected as well. So negative 3 over 2, you have to plus 1. It will become negative 1 over 2. So that means your graph will still go through something like this. The shape is still the same, basically, just that maybe the ratio looks a bit different. Right. But generally, the shape of the graph is still the same. All right. Okay, so this is still asymptote, yeah? And then this particular point now, because negative 3 plus 2, 3 over 2 plus 1, uh, so it will become negative half. Okay, so this is how my graph look like uh, after I uh, apply transformation slowly from 1 over x to this function. Okay, so for this question, they are interested for the range of the f. And the domain that we want to consider is x greater than 2. So from the whole diagram here, we are not going to consider the whole graph, right? We only consider the certain part of the graph, which is the graph x greater than 2, which means that I want to consider this part of the graph only. So for this part of the graph, what is the lowest point for this part of the graph? So it is getting closer and closer to y equals to 1, but it will not touch the y equals to 1, because y equals to 1 is asymptote, right? Then for the this part of the graph, it keeps on going up. So from here, you know that the range is actually from here at this part. So this is actually the range of f for the domain that you want to consider. Okay, so from here, very clearly, you can see that the range of f can be written as y greater than 1. Okay, so personally, I understand that for this range, right, there's only one mark given. Okay, but the steps looks are very, very long. So in exam, basically, you don't need to show all the details here, like all the graph here. But to me personally, I feel that when sketching out all the graph, it helps, uh, it actually helps us to understand better about the transformation of graph. And also, we can visualize the function clearer. So like for this kind of function, right, at least I know that I only want to consider this part of the graph after I sketch it, so I can see very clearly what is the range for the function. Alright, so of course this is not the only way. Lah. So we have many, many different methods uh, to find the range. So as long as you feel that oh, the method you can understand well, then you can just uh, proceed with it. Okay. Alright, so this is how we solve part A for the range of f. And now let's continue to part number B. Obtain an expression for f inverse x, then state the domain of f inverse. Okay, so to find the f inverse, usually I will let y equals to the original function. So the original function for me, for this question is 1 plus 3 over x minus 2. So this is y in terms of x, right? So to make it become f inverse function, I will want to make it, I want to rephrase everything here, become x equals to something, something y. So x in terms of y. Okay, so first step, I'm going to move the 1 over, become y minus 1. After that, I want to cross multiply. So the y minus 1 become the denominator. And after that, move the 2 over. And I'm having 2 plus 3 over y minus 1. So I successfully rephrase my equation become x in terms of y. So this particular function will be my inverse function. So please rewrite it into a function in terms of x. So f inverse x equals to 2 plus 3 over x minus 1. Okay, so this is quite straightforward. And after that, they're asking for the domain of f inverse. So for your information, when we're having domain and uh, range, right, about the inverse and uh, about the inverse function, uh, you need to know that the domain of inverse function is actually equals to the range of the function. Since you already have the range of the function just now, right, which is y greater than 1, therefore, to find out the domain of the inverse function, you just need to copy the answer, but change the y become x, because domain means the x, range means the y. So if we are looking for the domain of inverse function, I have to change it become x, so x greater than 1.
Okay. All right. So this is how we solve part B, and let's proceed to part number C. Okay. So for part C, we are having the function g, which is defined by g x equals to two x minus two for x greater than zero. So here they want us to find out the simplified expression for composite function g f x. So composite function gfx means that you are going to put the function fx inside the g. So what's my function fx here? 1 plus 3 over x minus 2, right? So that means now I want to substitute this whole thing into the function g as x. So I will be having this 2 and then the x, I will replace it by using function fx. Okay, then minus 2. Okay, then after that, we try to simplify slowly. So I'm having 2 plus 6 over 6, x minus 2, then minus 2 here. So after I simplify it, this is what I will have, 6 over x minus 2. Okay, so composite function basically means that you are trying to put function fx into g, or maybe you put a function g into fx. So for this example, it is actually fx into g. Okay. Yeah, so this is how we solve question number 7. Okay, so let's discuss, discuss question number 8. Alright, so we are given a diagram and then it is actually part of the graph y equals to sine ax plus b. Okay, where a and b are positive constants. So now they want us to state the value of a and also one possible value of b. Okay, so um, to decide the value for a and b, right? So first of all, we actually need to know what the a sequence all right for the transformation that we are having having here okay so basically you can see that it is there's a a inside the basic function sign multiply the a inside the basic function sign and also we're having a plus b which is also inside the basic function sign so generally it is the transformation is about f and then a with x plus b since both of this transformation right are uh, belongs to x direction Okay, so when we're having a transformation both in the same direction, right, both are in x direction or both are in y direction, then the sequence of transformation will be very important. So we need to consider the sequence of transformation first, right? So since uh, the whole thing, right, okay, ax plus b is inside the basic function, it is x direction. So maybe I will let a then x plus b equals to maybe a capital letter x. All right, that means uh, the transformation of this I'm having the x, so I want to know what is the transformation that I go through, right? what is the sequence of the transformation that I go through, so that I can get the final value for the x. Alright, so you can see that from here, you need to move the a over first. Okay, so when you move the a over, it will be 1 over ax, which means that the very first transformation that we are having here is a stretch in x direction. Stretch in x. Okay, then followed by... After that, only you minus b, right? So minus b means that the second transformation is translation. Okay, so the second transformation is translation in x. All right, so the sequence for this particular uh, fraction, or oh, sorry, this, this particular expression is, you actually have to, uh, you will need to have a stretch in x direction first, followed by the translation in x direction. So the, again, uh, the sequence is important here because both are in the same direction. So stretch is coming first, followed by translation in x. Alright, so let's talk about the stretching in x. Okay, so we actually need to uh, observe the question here. Okay, the graph provided so that we can try to state the value for a and also the b. Okay, so a is stretch in x, right? Okay, so first of all, I will want to draw a simple graph about our basic function, which is sine x. So if I draw the sine x uh, for maybe one cycle, all right, so by right, uh, by right, okay, this is everything in x exists. Uh, therefore, the cycle that I draw is actually this one. Okay, so start from zero and then zero. All right, so if let's say we are having the part like moving up and down okay if let's say i'm having a plus c outside the basic function 
then only my graph will be possible moving up and down okay so since all my all my transformation is in the x direction so everything is in left right okay everything is in left right therefore if i draw my original graph like this huh, then it denotes actually this part of the graph after the transformation okay all right then now let us have a look for the original graph first so my original graph this one is actually zero and then this one is actually pi then from here to here is actually pi over 2. Okay, so if you have a look here, right, basically the original function for the half cycle, okay, for the half cycle of the graph here, it is pi unit. Okay, and then if you have a look for the original function here, you will see that it's from negative pi over 3 until 5 pi over 3. So what's the unit here? So you can double check uh, 5 pi over 3 minus negative pi over 3. So you are having 2 pi. Okay, so you are having 2 pi, which means that basically uh, from pi, it becomes 2 pi. All right, so from pi, it becomes 2 pi. How can I change the pi become 2 pi? That means for this particular value, you multiply with, with 2 this particular value you also multiply with 2 then this particular value you also multiply with 2 and therefore the pi will become 2 pi okay so when you multiply the 2 that means it is a stretch in x direction okay it is a stretch in x direction with the stretch factor half okay because for for trans translation or transformation in x uh, basically everything is opposite so when you multiply the two right then the stretch factor is actually one over two okay all right so from here i already know that my a value here is actually half so this is how we decide okay so for me personally i try to compare the original graph with the graph after the transformation and then from there i slowly figure out right what is the value for the a which is a stretch factor okay so by right you, when you multiply a 2 because it is in x direction therefore the stretch factor is actually 1 over 2 okay all right then after that i want to know the b so what is the value for b okay so let's have a look here when we already multiply with 2 right so this particular graph here okay so maybe i try to label it again Okay, after I multiply everything with 2, this one will become the pi and this one will become 2 pi. Okay, so for this original value 0, you can see that it has been moving from 0, 0 to this, to this point. Okay, so this is negative pi over 3, which means that you are moving it pi over 3 unit to the left. Okay, and then original value here, this is a pi. So from pi, right, if you try to observe, uh, now the maximum value here, it, it is actually at the x value, which is 2 pi over 3. From pi to 2 pi over 3 also, you know that it is negative pi over 3. Okay, then you double check with another point. So this one, originally is 2 pi, and then now it becomes 5 pi over 3. So you double check. From 2 pi, how to make it become 5 over 3? It is also negative pi over 3. That means for this one, it is very obvious that we are trying to shift the whole graph pi over 3 unit to the left. So when you shift whole graph pi over 3 unit to the left, it is actually a translation. Okay, it is actually a translation with um, pi over 3 unit to the left. To the left means positive. Okay, so positive pi over 3. Therefore, value of B should be pi over 3. If we are moving it to the right hand side, Okay, if you are moving it to the right hand side for x direction, then it will be negative, right? But because now we are moving it to the right, uh, sorry, to the left hand side, therefore the b should be a positive value, pi over three. So this is basically how I decide the, uh, constant a and b. So first step, we need to know what's the sequence of the transformation first. Okay, so after you know the sequence of the transformation, then you try to figure out, okay, by using comparison of the original graph and also the graph after the transformation so from here you can slowly analyze and get the value for a and b all right okay so this is how we decide the answer so let's have a look for part b okay so for part b they give you another curve with the function y equals to fx that has a single stationary point so the stationary point 
it's either a maximum or minimum point, we don't know, okay, but it is with the coordinate P and Q, right? Then the curve is transformed to another curve with this equation, negative 3, F, then half, X plus, uh, 1 over 4, X plus 8. So for the transform curve, they want us to find the coordinate of the stationary point, giving an answer in terms of P and Q. Okay, so again, if you try to observe this one, right, let's have a look for the constant uh, for the details inside the function so you're having 1 over 4 x plus 8 inside the function right inside the basic function so this is very similar to what we did just now so you can see that for our transformation just now okay we are having a basic function sign and then inside is a bracket x plus b so we are having now 1 over 4 bracket x plus 8 so this tells us that the stretch comes first followed by the translation in x direction because the x direction both of these are x direction transformation right so the sequence is important huh? okay so one over four okay come first which is a stretch in f direction so in x direction and then plus eight which is a shift okay eight unit in uh, to the left okay then after that we are having a negative three outside the basic function so the negative three is stretched in y stretch in y okay so this is stretch in x and then this is translation in x okay so we have one transformation in y and also two transformation in x so the sequence is important in both x transformation the y transformation is doesn't matter you can come earlier or you can come it later all right but these two because they are in the same direction therefore the sequence is important you just need to make sure that when you are trying to find all the value right the stretch in x must come before the translation in x okay then for the stretching in y you can put it lastly no problem or you want to put it before the stretch in x also can all right so the sequence of the y is not important because it is a, a single translation in y direction only the both transformation in x direction is more important. The sequence is more important for these two, right? Okay, then let us start to answer the question now. Okay, so I start with original function first. So my original function is y equals to fx. Okay, and then my coordinate for the stationary point is pq. This is original function. So first, I will want to apply the stretch in y direction first so when i have stretch in y direction it will be negative 3 and then fx so the stretch in y direction basically will affect the y value only so affect the y value means that your y coordinate you need to multiply with negative 3 so q multiply with negative 3 you're having negative 3 q then after that what is the next transformation <clears throat> so the next transformation i will have it for stretch in x direction so again uh, the stretch in x direction must come first before the translation in x uh. so i'm having one over four x okay so what happened to my uh coordinate when i'm having a stretch in the x direction so it will affect the value of x where you need to multiply the coordinate of x by four so again it is opposite that uh, it is opposite value in the transformation of x right when you are having a stretch factor one over four basically for the x coordinate you need to multiply four okay because a stretch factor it looks like it's divided four right so when you want to apply it to the value of x it is always opposite which means that this one must be multiplied so you have to multiply the x coordinate with the four which is four p multiply with four you get four p okay the y coordinate will not be affected by the uh, transformation in the x direction okay so after that i will want to apply the last transformation of x which is plus 8 so the plus 8 here basically is uh, we shift the whole graph 8 unit to the left so when you are shifting the graph 8 you need to the left basically it will affect also the x direction x coordinate only where you're going to minus 8 inside the bracket it is plus 8 right so we want to apply it and shifting the value okay so in 
the x coordinate you have to minus it with 8. So you are having 4p minus 8 and also negative 3q again. The negative 3q is y coordinate. It will not be affected by the transformation uh, in x direction. Okay, so by right, this is actually our coordinate for the stationary point after we apply the three transformation here. So this is how we solve question number eight. All right, so we are at question number nine. Okay, we are given an equation like this. They want us to find the equation of the normal to the curve at the point A, giving your answer in the form of y equals to mx plus c. Okay, so before we can find out the equation of normal, first of all, we need equation of tangent to help us, uh, the gradient of tangent to help us. Okay, so to get the gradient of tangent, I need to apply differentiation to the curve, right? So I'm having, this is the curve equation, so I want to find out the dy dx. Right, so I have to find the dy dx, the differentiation, power, move it to the front, right? So you copy the constant, power, move it to the front, copy the x, power minus 1, become negative half. Minus 1, after you differentiate it, it becomes 0. Okay, so if you simplify this whole equation here, you are having 1 over square root x. Okay, then after that, uh, to get the equation of the normal, right, you, have, you need the gradient of tangent. So to get the gradient of tangent, what you need to do is, uh, because they are asking for the normal equation at this point, 4, 3. So to get a gradient of the tangent at this point, you substitute the x coordinate inside the dy dx. So you are having actually 1 over 2. So please take note that this particular value here is actually the gradient of tangent. Okay, then after that, you want to get the gradient of normal to form the equation. So you know that normal and tangent are perpendicular to each other, right? So there's one property where if you take the gradient of normal, multiply with the gradient of tangent, it should be equal to negative 1 because both of them are 90 degrees to each other. So the gradient of normal, I put it as n, yeah? Then tangent is half equals to negative 1. So from here, you actually get the result where the gradient of normal should be equal to negative 2. Okay, so this is the gradient of normal, negative 2, and this is the passing point, okay, for the normal equation, the normal line. So you have a passing point, you have the gradient, therefore you can form the uh, equation of the normal. Okay, not enough space, so I just put it here. So what's the equation of normal here? Equation of normal. We oh, yeah, equation, equation, equation of normal okay so equation of normal the general formula will be y minus y1 equals to m m is gradient x minus x1 so y is a passing point 4 and 3 right so y is a 3 m is negative 2 then x minus 4 okay so when you try to simplify this whole part here if you didn't do any careless mistake by right your equation of normal should be y equals to negative 2x plus 11. Okay, alright. So again, before you can form the equation of normal, basically you need to know your passing point and your gradient of normal. And to get know the gradient of normal, you need, a, you need to know the gradient of tangent first. And you can get the gradient of tangent by differentiating the equation. Alright, so this is what we have for part A. And let's proceed to part number B. Okay, so for part number B, they are saying that there's a point uh, moving along the curve in such a way that A, the rate of increase at A, uh, the rate of increase of the coordinate is, X coordinate is 3 cm per second. Alright, so at A, again, your A coordinate is 4, 3. At this particular point here, highlight the keyword rate of increase. Increase means positive. So when you're having something related to rate, right? It is something over dt. Okay, and they are saying the rate of increase of x coordinate, so it should be dx over dt. Okay, that equals to 3 cm per second. It should be positive 3. Why is it positive 3? Because of the word increase. If they give you the word decrease, then here you have to put negative. Right, so for this uh, sentence, uh, we actually get the useful information where dx over dt equals to 3. 
and now they want us to find the rate of increase for the y coordinate at a so again rate when you see the weight, word rate means dt la, something over dt and then they are interested for the y coordinate so it should be dy over dt so for this question they want you to find out dy over dt what's the value okay so to find out dy over dt you need to apply the chain rule where dy over dt equals to can be written as dy over something multiply with something over dt so what is the something here so for the something here right since uh, if you try to observe you already get the value for dx dt right so that means uh, you should use dx over dt here and you need to have dy over dx here okay so what is the value for dy over dx so again to get dy over dx you are having this particular curve at this particular point and just now if you have a look again I already tried to find out the dy dx at this particular point in part A, which is equals to half. Alright, so your dy dx uh, at this point is equals to half. So you can directly substitute the value here, which is equals to half. Then multiply with dx over dt. What's the value for dx over dt here? It is a 3. So multiply with 3. So by right, you should get 3 over 2 cm per second. Right, so this is how we solve the part number B for question number 9. Okay, so we are applying chain rule here. Alright, then after that, let's proceed further for part number C. Okay, now again, still at A. Uh, at A, the moving point suddenly change direction and speed and move down the normal in such a way that the rate of decrease of Y coordinate is constant at 5. Okay, so highlight the keyword rate, highlight the keyword decrease, highlight the keyword y coordinate. So for this particular phrase of sentence here, basically they are telling us that you are having dy over dt. Rate means something over dt. Lah. Y coordinate means dy, lah, oh, dy over dt equals to negative 5. Because of the negative is because of the word decrease. So decrease at 5 cm per second. So dy dt equals to negative 5. Alright, so what are they asking for? They are asking for as the point move down the normal, find the rate of change of its x coordinate. So again, rate of change of x coordinate, rate of change means something over dt. And then they are asking for dx over dt. Okay, huh? alright, so to get dx over dt, the general formula will be dx over something multiply with something over dt okay so again if i try to observe the equation uh, the information that i get for this part right i already have dy dt la. so that means so i want to apply the formula dy dt here so this one must be dy dt as well uh, dx dy okay this is another chain rule here okay then now dy dt i have the value negative 5 ma, right so can i still apply dx dy use the dx dy for the curve from part so generally for this question, right, we cannot use the dy/dx from first part anymore. So why? Okay, the reason is because of now they are not moving along the curve anymore. You can see that they are changing the direction and speed, move down the normal. Okay, so now they are moving it through the line normal, the normal equation. So what is the normal equation? Y equals to negative 2x plus 11. Okay, so they are not moving along the curve, which is the original curve anymore. They are not moving along this curve anymore, but they are actually moving now the normal line. Y equals to negative 2x plus 11. Okay, so for the normal curve, for the equation of normal, since you are having original or, um, equation of normal is y equals to negative 2x plus 11, right? So what is the dy dx for the normal line so the dy dx for the normal line will be negative 2 and now the dy dx here is actually a dy dx dy here is actually the dx dy for this normal so dy dx equals to negative 2 therefore the dx dy will be equals to negative 1 over 2 right or 1 over negative 2 then multiply with the value of the y dy dt which is negative 5 so if you multiply them together so you have 5 over 2 cm per second.
right so this is how we solve the part c okay so for this part c you need to be uh very careful right because some of the students they, they are not aware that a the dx dy here basically refer to the equation of normal but not the original curve equation okay so very likely you might do some characteristic here okay so if you read the question very carefully because they are saying that the points are moving down the normal so we have to use the dy dx from the normal equation to apply in the chain rule for this question okay so let's have a look for question number 10 we are given a diagram and then uh, they are saying something about the diagram here you can have a look at. so we're having the center o right so this whole circle is with the center o radius r and then the angle a will be angle a will be is actually 2.8 radian and then the shaded region is bounded by two arcs uh. okay so the upper arc is the part of the circle with the center and radius arc and the lower arc okay so the lower arc is this one okay so the lower arc is basically uh part of the circle with the center c so the center is here and then the radius is capital letter r all right so this is something about the circle okay so first of all they want to state the size of the angle aco in radian so angle aco means this one Okay, so before I can find the angle ACO, maybe I can try to find out the angle AOC first, this one. Alright, so what's the angle <coughs> AOC? Angle AOC, basically we can get it by using 2 pi, which is the whole thing, the whole circle here is 2 pi, right? Okay, then minus 2.8 and divided by 2 because 2 pi minus 2.8 means this whole thing. And then it is actually uh, the angle for two triangle here, right? So I have to divide by two because two AOC is actually the angle for one of the triangle only. So divided by two, therefore you are having pi minus 1.4. Okay, so since you already know that this particular angle here is pi minus 1.4, and now by using the total area, uh, the total angle in the triangle, uh, to find out the uh, angle ACO. So to find the ACO, you know that the total area, the total angle in the triangle is 180 degrees, which is pi, okay, minus the big angle, which is pi minus 1.4, and you have to divide it by 2, because angle ACO and OCA are the same. Okay, so you take pi minus, pi minus 1.4 divided by 2 so from here basically you will get the answer 0 0.7 radian all right so of course this is not the only way to find the angle aco you might have a shorter method or shorter way to find out the answer so as long as you can get 0 0.7 then definitely for you to apply the particular method that you use okay so this is what you have for part a all right so let's have a look for part b Okay, so for part B, they want us to find R in terms of R. So the capital letter R in terms of the small letter R. Okay, so again, I want to come back to this part again, the diagrams, to have a look. Okay, so to find out the capital letter R, right, there are many ways that you can find out the value. Okay, so for me personally, I will actually divide this part, the triangle into two right angle triangle here. Okay, so this one become R over 2, right? And this angle, I know that it's 0 0.7. This one I already find out, right? The angle ACO is equal to 0 0.7. So I separate the triangle here, the ACO of triangle OAC or OCA into half, into two, two right angle triangle. So I know that the base here will be one of them is R over 2. Lah. The hypotenuse will become the small letter R. Okay, so for part number B, if I want to find the R, I can form a trigger ratio from this small angle here, the small triangle here, where I can have cos 0 0.7, okay, equals to R over 2 divided by R. Fair enough. So cos 0 0.7 means that it is actually the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So the adjacent is R over 2. Hypotenuse is R. So if you try to move all the values slowly here, Okay, so we'll be having 2R and then cos 0 0.7. Right, then if you try to press calculator, of course, you'll get the value, which is uh, equals to a long value here, 1.529, 684, 375R. 
and of course your r can be written as 1.53 r correct to 3 significant figure Again, for this question, there are many different ways that you can find the capital letter R in terms of small letter R. So this is just a suggestion for you, where I'm cutting the uh, triangle OAC into two right angle triangle and use the trigger ratio to find it out. Okay, all right. Then after that, we can have a look for part C. Okay, so for part C, they want us to find the area of the shaded region in terms of R. Okay, so to find the shaded region in terms of R, there are many ways also for you to find out the answer. Okay, so let's figure out first, huh? shaded region. Okay, so if we have a look here, to find the shaded region, you can actually use the um, first method is this one. You can use the sector AOB. Okay, then minus this small area here. Alright, so this small area here, of course, it is not a sector, right? Okay, but the sector, the red color one is a sector. So sector AOB minus a small area AOB. Alright, so this is one way. Okay. Of course, there are many other different ways. So as long as when you rephrase your answer and your final answer is the same like what we show you here, basically your method might be correct. All right. Okay, so for this one, I'm using the sector OAB minus the small area OAB here. The small area means this one, the blue color one. Okay, so I try to write out first. Okay, so I'm using sector AOB minus a small area AOB. And now I need to put in all the possible formula first. So let's have a look for sector AOB first. Okay, so to get the sector AOB, right, I already know that the radius is R. The radius is R. So by right, you should have a half R square. Theta, theta is 2.8. Okay, so I plug in the formula first. Half R square, theta. So our theta here will be 2.8. Okay, then minus... Now let's figure out how to find the small area AOB. Right, so to find the small area AOB, what can we do here is to find out this small area, right? This just now I said the blue color area. Huh? Basically, you can try to consider we are taking the sector ACB or CAB. Okay, so this is a sector, right? The green color one is a sector. You take the sector minus two times of this triangle area. If you minus, you take the sector minus these two triangle area, then basically you're having the small area OAB that I showed you just now. Okay, so this is what we can do. Right, so now, what is the formula for the small area CAB? So the small area CAB, you need to know that the radius is a capital letter R. Okay, so to get this sector, you're having half, capital letter R square. The radius is capital letter R, right? And then what is the angle here? So you know that one of them is 0 0.7 for part A. So the other one is also 0 0.7. They are the same triangle. So 0 0.7 plus 0 0.7, you're having 1.4. Okay, so this is the <coughs> formula for the sector CAB. Okay, so again, I put it back to my equation here first. So I'm having half capital letter R square. So for capital letter R square, right, just now we have proved that it is equal to 1.53 R, capital letter R, then square, then multiply with the angle. The angle is 1.4. Okay, <clears throat> so for you, when you write out the step here, right, you can write 1.53 R because it is in part B. But when I press the calculator, right, to get the final answer, the 1.53, I will actually press the long value. Okay, all right, so to make sure that I get the most accurate answer, all right, so I will usually, when write, I will write out the short value, 1.53. But when I press the calculator to get the most accurate answer for the final answer, I will still press it with the long value. Or you can actually keep it as this one, okay, 2R cos 0.5. 
zero point seven, then the whole thing square full socket. So I will just try to keep it as original as possible when I'm trying to do the calculation for the final answer. Okay, All right. So after I settle it with half r square one point four, so now I need to minus two times of the triangle area. So minus two times of the triangle area. So let's have a look at uh, how to find out the area of the triangle. So to find the area of the triangle, if I have a look for this particular triangle here. Again, uh, there are many different ways that you can do it. So one way is I can take the formula half. Then I take these two lines. <coughs> AO and also OC. Okay, so this two length here, it will be R square. R times side is R square. And then side, the angle between these two lengths. So this angle is actually pi minus 1.4. Okay, so pi minus 1.4. This one also can. So some students will say that, how about if I use the right angle triangle just now to find the uh, area? Also can, no problem. All right, so again, <laughs> like what I said, Excuse me. There are many different ways that you can find out the answer. Okay, so for me personally, the one triangle here, I'm using this one, a half R square, then sine pi minus 1.4. Okay, and after that, I have to times 2 because I'm having the two similar triangles. Okay, yeah, so now I will try to put in the value that I have here into my calculation. So minus 2 times of half R square and then sine pi minus 1.4 then close bracket and close the whole thing okay all right then after that you what you need to do now is you just need to slowly rephrase everything here lah. so 2.5 uh, 2.8 divided by 2 you are having 1.4 so 1.4 r squared Okay, then minus. All right, then for the green color part. Okay, so uh, again, uh, the 1.53 here, I will actually press the value with a long, original long value. So the original long value is 1.529684375. Then you have to square it. You have to square it. Then multiply with 1.4. Then divided by 2. So by right, huh? You should have this value, 1.63795401 R squared. Okay, <clears throat> then after that, you have to minus 2 times of the area of the triangle. So you are trying to use sine, then pi minus 1.4. With a sign, then pi minus 1.4. Okay, so by right, I should have 0 0.985 something. Okay, so 2 times of half times, oh, sorry, the 2 and the half here can be cancelled off, right? 2 and also the half here can be cancelled off. Okay, so by right, you should have sine pi minus 1.4, which is actually 0 0.985. Four four nine seven three and then R square. Okay, so you can see that every term here uh, we are having R square, right? So you need to try to simplify all the terms here. Okay, very carefully. Okay, so let's see what is the answer that we get. Okay, so by right, uh, you'll get the also very long value, uh, which is 0 0.747495729 R squared. Then after that, if I want to correct it to three significant figures, then I'll get 747R squared. Correct to three significant figures. So this is a uh, meaning that I mentioned just now. Uh, when I write out the answer in my step, right, usually I will write out the short answer 1.53. But when I press the calculator, basically I will press out the long value. All right, so <laughs> do is my calculation here. Basically, um, usually my step will be quite long. 
<clears throat> Alright, I will keep all the original long answer so that I will get the most accurate answer at the end. Alright, so some students, they don't like to write their step so long. Of course, you can write it short, but make sure that you always keep it as original as possible so that your final answer will not be uh, having too much difference uh, from the original accurate answer. Okay, so again, for shaded region for this part, this is one of the method that you can use. Alright, so there are many more different methods that you can use also. All right. So you can try to figure it out. As long as your final answer equals to this one, then it should be no problem for you to apply the method that you are using. Okay, right. So this is how we solve question number 10. Okay, so now we are at the question 11, uh, the very last question for this paper. <coughs> okay, so uh, we are given a diagram again. And we know that this is a curve uh, with this equation. And then the line x equals to 1 and 2 are uh, intersect the curve at p and q. So they are trying to describe what is happening here right and r is the stationary point on the curve so r is the stationary point which means it is either a this one yeah, i think is a very obvious is the minimum point right because you are having a curve right so they really show you that r is at a, is a local minimum they want you to verify that the coordinate of r is 3 over 2 and find the y coordinate of r okay so for first part since they are asking for the x coordinate for the stationary point of course you need to apply differentiation right okay so my original curve is this one y equals to x plus 2 then i bring the bracket up become 2x minus 1 power negative 2 so apply differentiation so i'm having dy dx here differentiate x you get a 1 okay so differentiate 2 you copy it uh, 2 is a constant for the x, right? For the bracket x, and so you can copy the constant. Power, bring it in front to the bracket, become negative 2. Copy the bracket 2x minus 1. Power minus 1 become negative 3. Differentiate the thing inside the bracket. So differentiate 2x minus 1, you get 2. So you multiply the 2 at the back. And if you try to simplify this whole thing, you are having 1 minus 8 over 2x minus 1 power 3. Uh, power 3, yes. Okay, then after that, once you get your dydx ready, right, to find out the stationary point, x coordinate of the stationary point, you need to let dydx equals to 0. Okay, when you let dydx equals to 0, and you can try to rephrase your equation so that you can get a coordinate for the x. Ah. Okay, so you're having 8 over this bracket equals to 1. Then after you try to simplify, you're having 2x minus 1 equals to cube root of 8. Then x equals to what? x equals to 2 plus 1 divided by 2. So you're having 3 over 2 here. So it is verified that the x coordinate for the minimum point is 3 over 2, which is correct already. And now they want us to find the y coordinate of r. So to find the y coordinate of r, it is very easy. You just substitute the value of x into your original y equation. So if you substitute inside, you're having 3 over 2, then plus. <coughs> Uh, 2 over 2x so 2 times 3 over 2 minus 1 then the whole thing have a power square power 2 okay so your value of y if you didn't do any careless mistake by right it should be 2 so your r is having the coordinate 3 over 2 and also 2 Okay, so this is how we solve the first part of the equation here. First part of the question. Alright, so let's continue to part number B. Okay, so for part B, <coughs> they want you to find the exact value of the area of the shaded region. Okay, so to find the <coughs> exact value of the area of the shaded region, now if you have a look again, to find this shaded area, right? This shaded area basically uh, is bounded by uh, there are also two ways to solve it. Uh. So this area basically is bounded by the area, uh, the, the line, sorry, the line and also the curve. Okay, so the first method is you try to find the equation of the line. Okay, then you can integrate them to find the area below the line <coughs> minus the area for the integration uh, from the integration of the curve, which is minus this area, then you get a shaded area. So that's first way. <coughs> so for this method, right, 
Um, personally, um, I feel that it's a bit long because you need to form the equation of the line first. It is not hard, <laughs> just I feel that it is slightly longer. So if let's say you don't want to find the equation of the line and apply the integration, what we can do is, you actually can see that <coughs> we are having the trapezium here. Okay, so you can find out the area of this trapezium. And after that, you integrate the curve. So when you integrate the curve, right, you're having this red color area. So you use the trapezium area minus the integration area, then you can get the shaded. So for me personally, I maybe we want to use this method, right? Okay, so let's have a look for, set up our question first. Okay, so to find out the shaded area. And they're asking for the exact value, right? so highlight the keyword exact value, which means that your final answer should be in either such form, pi form, then it shouldn't be any decimal number. Lah. Shaded area. Shaded area. Okay. So to find the shaded area, I want to use the area of trapezium. Minus the area under curve, right? Area under the curve. Okay, so how to find out the area of trapezium? So to find out the area of trapezium, I actually need the height for these two lines. <coughs> this one, I will need this height and also this height. That means I need to know what is the y coordinate for P and also what is the y coordinate for Q. Okay, so to find the y coordinate for P and Q, you just need to substitute. 1 and 2 into the curve equation to get the value of y. Right, so I think this is quite straightforward. So maybe you can try to apply it here. Okay, so maybe I need to write beside. Yeah? So first of all, when x equals to 1, right? So when x equals to 1, what happened to the y value? So the y value is equals to 1 plus 2 over 2 minus 1 square. I get a 3. Then when x equals to 2, <coughs> excuse me, when x equals to 2, I'm having y equals to 2 plus 2 over 4 minus 1 squared. And I get a value which is 20 over 9. Okay, alright, so I have 3 and also 20 over 9 for the y. So that means all, this height is actually the 3. So this is actually 20 over 9. Okay, so to find out the area of the trapezium, I actually need half. Then the addition for two parallel lines. So the addition for the two parallel line here is actually 3 plus 20 over 9. Okay, so 3 plus 20 over 9 multiply with the height. So the height for this trapezium basically is this one from 1 until 2, lah. so it's 1 unit, so you need to multiply with 1. Okay, then minus area under the curve, so the area under the curve is actually from 1 until 2. Okay, so from the diagram, it is from 1 until 2, right? B from, from D to Q is actually from 1 until 2, and then I want to integrate the curve, so that I can get the area under the curve. Okay, so we go back to our steps here. So the area under the curve, what is the curve equation? So you're having x plus 2 and then 2x minus 1 power negative 2. Okay, right. So this is how we set up the step. And now you can try to simplify the area of the trapezium first if you want. All right, so you're having 3 plus 20 over 9. Then divided by 2. <clears throat> so by right, you're having the value 47 over 16. Oh, sorry, 18. Okay, then minus, integrate the curve. So integrate this curve, integrate x, we are having x squared over 2. Integrate <coughs> this one, copy the constant first, copy the bracket, then power plus 1 become negative 1. Divided by the new power. Okay, so divided by the new power, you are having negative 1. Differentiate the thing inside the bracket, you are having 2, right? So divide it by 2 as well. 
then you want to substitute in the value 2 and 1 later. Okay, so usually for me, before I simplify anything, I prefer to make my equations, my expression looks easier first. I simplify my expression first. So for this part, the 2 and the 2, we can cancel off with each other. And then if I try to simplify, I'm having negative 1 over 2x plus 1. Oh, sorry, 2x minus 1, not plus 1. 2x minus 1. Then substitute in the limit 2 and 1. Okay, so just make sure that you are very careful when you substitute all the value. 2 squared is a 4 divided by 2, you get a 2. Minus 1 over 2 squared is a 4. 4 minus 1, you get a 3. After that, minus this one, you're having 1 over 2. Then minus 1. <coughs> Alright, so now what you need to do now is just try to simplify the term here. Okay, if you didn't do any careless mistake, right? By right, you should have 4 over 9 as answer. Okay, so you try again. 47 divided by 18 minus 2 plus 1 over 3 plus half minus 1. So you should have 4 over 9 as your final answer. <clears throat> okay, alright. So this is basically how we solve all the questions for this paper. Thank you very much for watching this video.